So let's apply some of the things that we've been learning about random variables to analyzing a digital communications type problem. We're going to derive the distribution of a received signal's sample value that we would use to demodulate or receive and decode back to bits an original message that was transmitted. What we're going to be investigating specifically is what we call polar signaling. With polar signaling, you have a pulse shape. And for the sake of this problem, let's just assume that we have this pulse that's of length one second. And we're calling this pulse P of T. And it's with this single pulse shape that we convey bits of information. For example, I'm going to transmit either 2 PT. So I'm going to take my pulse P of T and multiply it by 2. Or I'm going to transmit minus PT. I'm going to use the 2 P of T for when I want to transmit a binary 1, and I'm going to use minus 2 P of T when I want to transmit a binary 0. So if I have binary information, this is how I communicate it to the other side of the transmission link by sending either positive rectangular pulses or negative rectangular pulses. And just to make things interesting here, I'm not just using um, positive pulses and negative pulses, I'm throwing a 2 in there, so I multiply by 2 just to have something to look at here. So this is how we're going to communicate information. This is what we call polar signaling because we just have a single pulse shape and the information is contained in the polarity of the pulse, so to speak, whether it's a positive pulse or a negative pulse. How is our receiver going to get this information? The job of the receiver is to get back to bits of the original message that was being transmitted. So the way our receiver is going to get back to bits is it's going to sample every one half second. So if you'll notice one half second is right in the middle of our pulse shape P of T because P of T goes from 0 to 1. So when our receiver samples and it samples a value of 2, it knows that a binary 1 must have been sent because the only way I can get a positive value of 2 when I sample this is if you transmitted 2 P of T. Similarly, if the receiver samples and gets a negative 2, it decides that a binary zero must have been transmitted because the only way that it would sample something and get a negative two is if negative two P of T had been transmitted and that is what we are using to convey the binary information zero. So at the receiver we're simply just sampling and making a decision based on that sample value and in the case of no noise this works perfectly. What I transmit is either two P of T or minus two P of T and what is received is exactly 2p of t or minus 2p of t. So the samples that the receiver writes down are perfectly and exactly either 2 or minus 2. And it makes perfect decisions about the binary bits. But that's kind of a naive um, problem in the real world. We always have some type of noise. So let's bring in some noise to this problem to make it a little interesting. So the received signal is going to be plus or minus 2p of t. So I'm kind of lumping either option here with that plus minus plus n of t. So what we've done is we've introduced some noise, and in fact this is what we call a noise Gaussian random process. That's the type of thing I'm adding in here. We haven't gotten to random processes in this class. We'll get to that later, but for now you only need to know a few things about these. But you can think of this n of t as this noisy signal that is corrupting what was transmitted, either 2p of t or minus 2p of t. What you need to know is a few things. So this R of T is what the receiver is sampling. So just like before, the receiver is going to sample something to make a decision. And the only difference now is we've tacked on this term N of T. The thing that you need to know about random processes for this problem is that when you sample a Gaussian random process, and that's what we have here, N of T is what we're calling a Gaussian random process. And again, we'll make clear that definition of what a random process is and what a Gaussian random process is later. But for now, all you need to know is that if you sample a Gaussian random process, what you get is a Gaussian random variable. And a Gaussian random variable is something that we've studied, and you know what that is. So when my receiver samples R of t, we're going to get either the number 2 or minus 2 from the deterministic portion of this signal, and we're going to get some Gaussian random variable due to having sampled noise as well. So the way I can think of this is after sampling, I can really think of my receiver as having received some random number r that is either plus 2 plus noise or minus 2 plus noise, where capital N is a Gaussian random variable that I obtained by sampling this Gaussian random process. So again, 
the plus or minus 2 comes from the pulse that I transmitted. I either transmitted a positive 2p of t or a minus 2p of t. So since this is toggling back and forth between plus and minus 2 based on the bits I'm sending, we actually can model this as what we call a discrete random variable. It's discrete because it only takes on two values, in this case, plus 2 and minus 2. And what we're going to do is we're going to think of this discrete quantity as, as the random variable x. So we're going to think of the sample at the receiver that's either plus 2 or minus 2. We're going to go ahead and just designate that as the random variable x. The probability density function for this discrete random variable has a very interesting form. Since it only takes on two values, the PDF is zero everywhere except for these two values. So the probability density function just consists of two impulses. One is located at two, and one is located at negative two. And for now, we're assuming that the probability of getting two or minus two are equally likely. So half the time when we sample, we get a positive two, and half the time when we sample, we get negative two, because the underlying assumption is that the bits we have to transmit are equally likely. If I plotted this, this is what it looks like as a function of x. It just consists of two impulses of density 1 half, and they are located at minus 2 and 2. More technically, more accurately, this is actually what we call the probability mass function, because it's really not density. There's actually discrete masses located on the x-axis at minus 2 and 2. So that's one part of this random variable r. The other part is what we mentioned earlier. This is just a continuous random variable. We obtained n by sampling a Gaussian random process. So n is just a continuous Gaussian random variable. And we know the form for that probability density function. It's just the normal kind of bell-shaped curve looking function. In a cartoon, it kind of looks like this bell-shaped curve. And mathematically, it's given by the equation 1 over sigma times square root of 2 pi e to the n squared over 2 sigma squared. So this is a zero mean quantity, and its variance, how much it's spread out on the axis, is determined by the parameter sigma. So what we're interested in doing is we are interested in determining what the distribution of the received sampled signal is. So given that we know that x is a discrete random variable with the distribution there on the lower left, and given that n is a continuous Gaussian random variable described here, we're adding these two things together to get this new random variable r, and it's that value of r that our receiver analyzes and makes a decision based on. So the big question we have is, what is the distribution or the density function of r? Let's figure that out, and we can do that. So here's the model that we have. The received sample is given by the random variable x plus the random variable n, and we have a very important assumption here that it's important to point out and that is that x and n are independent. And that, that's reasonable. Basically, n is our channel noise, and x is related to the signals that we're sending. As we're sending signals, the channel noise just does what it does. It is not influenced or impacted at all by what we do. The thermal noise of the channel just is. And this is a very common assumption that we have in digital communications and communications in, serial, in general, in that channel noise is independent of what is transmitted. Well, that's a very important assumption, and it's a very nice assumption mathematically, because if x and n are independent, then we have a very nice result. Since r is just the sum of two independent random variables, writing down a mathematical expression for the probability density function of r is very easy. It's just given by the probability density of function of x convolved with the probability density function of n. So this is a general result. Anytime you add independent random variables, the resulting density function of that sum of random variables is just given by their convolution of their density functions. So we can actually go ahead and compute very easily what the density function of R is by evaluating this equation. So again, remember what Px of x is. It's just these two points on the real axis at plus and minus 2. So that quantity is what we're going to convolve with our Gaussian random variable. So kind of in pictures or cartoons, this is the math we need to do. And this is actually very easy, because if you recall, when you convolve with an impulse function, convolving with an impulse function is easy. All you do is place the underlying shape at that point on the axis. So after we do this convolution, we're going to end up with a Gaussian curve down at minus 2 from having placed the Gaussian shape at minus 2, and we're going to end up with another Gaussian shape at positive 2 from having placed the Gaussian shape at the location 2. 
And this is the probability density function that we are looking for, that we're trying to compute. So in pictures, this is what we expect to obtain. Let's go ahead and do the math, though. Let's go ahead and compute this. So if we plug in the probability density function for x, let's put brackets around it, that is what we need to convolve with the probability density function for n. So this is the math that I need to do. And this isn't hard because the convolution operator is distributive. So instead of convolving one thing with a sum, I can actually write this as two convolutions that are summed together. So when I do that, I'm going to get 1 half times 1 over sigma square root of 2 pi. And now I need to convolve delta of x minus 2 with e to the minus n squared over 2 sigma squared. So when I do that, all that does is shift the Gaussian shape to the location of the impulse. So what that means mathematically is that I replace n with n minus 2, because that is where my impulse is located. It's located at x equals 2. Similarly, I'm going to have another term now that is 1 half times the delta function x plus 2 convolved with my Gaussian shape. And all that is is going to be my Gaussian shape shifted to the location of the impulse. So mathematically, that means I have to replace all the n's with n plus 2's. So this is what I obtain. I have two pieces here for my probability density function. This first part is basically what I get for when 2p of t is transmitted. And it's represented by this part of the cartoon plot here. And this piece of the resulting convolution is due to when I transmit minus 2p of t. So that part pops up for when I transmit it minus 2p of t, and it's given by this part of the kind of cartoon sketch above. So we have computed the density function for the random variable r, and r is what we get when we sample the received signal in the presence of noise. And you can see what's happened. Without noise, normally we would have gotten either 2 or minus 2. We would have just had mass functions on the real line. But because of this Gaussian noise that's been introduced, we don't just get exactly 2 or exactly minus 2. We basically get those numbers, but kind of perturbed on the real axis. So you can think of being at 2 and then being wiggled around by noise, so to speak. Similarly, when minus 2 PT is, tr is transmitted, we should sample and get minus 2, but because of noise, we've kind of been perturbed on the axis. And that per perturbation is due to the Gaussian noise, and that's why our resulting PDF consists of two kind of Gaussian humps on the real axis.